Greetings! In today's video, we are going to be exploring the proof for the derivative of sine x. This is not going to be an easy proof, which is why I've parked this as an optional video within the calculus videos. At the end of this video, I will also be deriving the derivative for the cosine and tangent function using this result. Let us also welcome Sandwich Sensei, who will be helping us with this proof. Now let's begin with some intuition of why cosine would be the natural answer to the derivative of sine. And we can approach this graphically for one period of the sine graph from 0 to 2 pi. Now observe that at where x is 0, the gradient begins at its maximum. So the function for the gradient function, the dy dx function, also needs to start from a maximum point. At pi over 2, the sine graph has plateaued to a maximum point, so the gradient is 0. So the gradient function, the dy dx, will also be at 0. By pi, the sine graph would be decreasing at its fastest, so the gradient would be at its minimum point. Now we can repeat this reasoning for 3 pi over 2, as well as 2 pi. And looking at the points that we have collected, you can sort of guess that the gradient function would closely resemble the cosine function or it would be the cosine function. Now, this is not sufficient. We need a proper proof in math. So before we go into the proper proof, I would also like to put an important warning here. The entire derivation will be done in radian measure and we will understand this better when we go through the proof in detail. Now, this proof is going to mirror the proof for the power rule. We will start with a point, x, sine x on the sine graph, and we'll consider a second point at x plus h, comma, sine of x plus h. So we can connect these two points using a red secant. The gradient of this secant is given by the formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, which would be sine of x plus h minus sine x over h. Using the addition angle formula, we can expand sine of x plus h. That will give us two terms, sine x cos h plus cos x sine h. We now need to express this in terms of sine x and cosine x, as what you see here. Now we need to make our h as small as possible so that the secant turns into a tangent. For us to do that, we'll need to take some limits. So we need to observe this sine h over h as h tends to zero. And this function is so common in mathematics that it's given the name the sinc function. So our aim for completing this proof is to show that sine h over h would tend to 1 as h tends to 0. Secondly, we we'll also need to show that cos h minus 1 over h tends to 0 as h tends to 0 as well. And if we can do that, we would have proven that the derivative of sine x would be cos x. So let's try to better understand the sinc function, which can be thought of as the product of a sine function with the reciprocal function, 1 over x. Now, how would this function look like? Well, we can start by plotting the roots. Aside from x equals to 0, every other root of sine x will still be the root for this sinc function, since 0 times anything aside from infinity is going to give us 0. We can also work out the points where sine x is at its maximum or minimum. So anything multiplied by 1 or negative 1, the values for the reciprocal function 1 over x will be preserved, although at certain points it might just flip from positive to negative. At this point, you could also notice that this sinc function is a product of two odd functions. So we're going to get an even function. So this function is going to be symmetric about the one axis. After plotting a smooth curve around the points that we know, the question now is what happens as this function tends to zero? 
will the reciprocal function win and it tends to infinity or will the sine function win and will the function tend to zero? Or maybe it might be something else entirely. A numerical approach would be just to construct the table and check the values of sine x over x when x is 0 0.1, 0 0.01, and just make x smaller and smaller. And it seems quite obvious that the function tends to 1 as x tends to 0. Now the analytical approach would be to consult Sandwich Sensei. Observe this red right angled triangle constructed from this red point on the unit circle. Using trigonometry, the height of this red triangle is sine x and the base is cosine x. So this red triangle has an area of half sine x cosine x. This red area is smaller than this area of the green circular sector. And this circular sector has an area of half r squared theta. And this formula only works if theta is measured in radians. That's why it is very important in calculus that everything is done in radian measure. So this green circular sector is going to have a formula of half times x. When we extend this red triangle, we can also get the area of this blue triangle, which is a similar triangle. And this blue similar triangle has an area that's larger than the green circular sector. So this blue triangle has a height of tangent x and a base of 1. So its area is going to be given by half tangent x. Simply put, this green area is sandwiched by a lower bound of this red triangular area and an upper bound of this blue triangular area. And this set of inequalities shown geometrically is going to be the foundation of our argument as we investigate the limits of the sinc function. This inequality will hold as x tends to 0. Now we can simplify this inequality further by dividing the common factor of half across all the three terms. Next, we can replace tangent x with the identity of sine x over cosine x. Now we can divide throughout by sine x. And this will give us cosine x is less than or equals to x over sine x, which is less than or equals to 1 over cosine x. You can see that in the middle of this inequality, we almost have it. We have x over sine x instead of sine x over x, meaning that we need to flip this inequality. So let's do this slowly. So first, let's look at the first two terms. Cosine x is less than or equals to x over sine x. Now, what we can do is we can multiply by sine x on both sides and divide by cosine x on both sides. Now, we, this will work because if we consider the first quadrant, cosine x and sine x are all positive. So it almost looks like you are swapping the terms of the numerator on the left with the denominator on the right term. Similarly, we can do the same thing. We'll just divide by x on both sides and voila we get sine x over x is less than or equals to 1 over cosine x. Next, let's consider the last two terms of the inequality and we'll do the same thing. So what we're doing is we're just dividing by x on both sides and multiplying by cosine x on both sides. Then we multiply by sine x on both sides. So this will give us our lower bound, which is still cosine x. Now we can start the squeezing process. Since sine x over x is trapped between by an upper bound of 1 over cosine and a lower bound of cosine x, let's take the limit of what would happen if x tends to 0. So the lower bound is going to become cosine of 0 and the upper bound will be 1 over cosine 0. But cosine 0 is just 1, so we can replace that with 1 on both sides. This means that as x tends to 0, sine x over x would tend to 1. So let's park this limit in one corner and let's look at the other limit of 1 minus cosine x over x as x tends to 0. Now this can be done using our previous result. First, we need to multiply by 1 plus cosine x to both the numerator and the denominator. Now what we'll get in the numerator 1 minus cosine square x 
can be simplified using the Pythagorean identity to give us sine square x. Next, we can split this into the product of two limits. And in the first limit, you can see that this is the result that we got before. Sine x over x tends to 1 as x tends to 0. So we only need to consider the second limit. And this is a simple limit because this will just give us sine 0 over 1 plus cosine 0, which is just 0 in the numerator divided by 2 in the denominator, which is just 0. So this is our second result. So with this, we can go back and now try to differentiate sine x using first principles. So just to recap, we used the addition angle formula. We expanded the sine x plus h. We simplified the limit into this form. And now we can resolve these limits. You can see that the limit of sine h over h as h tends to 0 will give us 1. So we'll get cosine x, 1 cosine x. Now for the other limit, this will be the same as the negative of the limit that we discovered earlier. So the limit of cosine h minus 1 over h is going to give us 0, so the sine x will vanish. So the final result is just cosine x. So let's park this result. We differentiate sine x, we're going to get cosine x. Now we can use this result to differentiate cosine x. First, we transform cosine x into sine of pi over 2 minus x. This is using the complementary angle formula. Next, we can just differentiate sine pi over 2 minus x to give us cosine pi over 2 minus x. But since we have an inner function, this is not just a simple function, this is a composite function, we'll have to use the chain rule. So don't forget, we need to multiply by the derivative of the inner function of pi over 2 minus x. So let's look at this. How can we simplify? Well, cosine pi over 2 minus x will just become sine of x using the complementary angle formula again. And the derivative of pi over 2 minus x is going to give us a negative sign. So the final result is going to be negative sine x. So let's park this result here. Lastly, we'll use the result of the derivative of sine x and cosine x to differentiate tangent x. And firstly, we'll split tangent x using the identity into sine x over cosine x and employ the quotient rule. So I'm going to set sine x as my function u and cosine x as my function v. So the quotient rule states that I will get v, which is cosine x, times du dx, so the derivative of sine x, minus u sine x times dv dx over v square. So let's break this down. So in our numerator, we'll get cosine x times the derivative of sine x. So that's going to give us cos square x. We also have minus sine x times the derivative of cosine x, which is another negative sine x. So this will give us plus sine square x. Then in our numerator, cos square x plus sine square x equals to 1 using the Pythagorean identity. And we can simplify 1 over cos square x into secant square x. And this is our final result. With this, we have proven the derivative for sine x, cosine x, and tangent x to be cos x, negative sine x, and secant squared, respectively. With that, we have come to the end of this short interlude within the calculus lecture series just to derive the derivatives of the trigonometric functions. Do stay tuned to part 9 where the next proper lecture will go into the applications of the derivatives for trigonometric functions. Thank you for your kind attention and have a great day of learning.